Still Division 2, the sequel to Eugen's 2017 game of the same name, moves from the hedgerow hell of Normandy to the swampy marshlands of Belorussia. Specifically, SD2 centers on 1944 and the massive Soviet encirclement that crushed Army Group Center, known as Operation Bagration. Does the sequel seize on the opportunity left at the table of the original, or does it somehow manage to fall short? Still Division is one of those titles that you want to see work out. You end up devoting hundreds of hours to it. You start to cherish it, maybe love it. And before you know it, you're considering taking her home to the family. But then you realize there's just one bit missing. And it's kind of a big deal. It's like when you find the perfect woman, but she doesn't do that one thing. Only in Still Division's case, that one thing is a good single player campaign. And when she says she'll get better at it, you actually kind of believe her. So I was anxious to see what our future could hold, and when I booted up the game and saw the title screen and music, I have to admit the first impression was there. Just look at that aesthetic. The lacquered furniture, music, war maps, lighting, radio, war maps. It really gives you the sense of something grand going on. The sense of, this is it. The big one. Bagradian. It all comes together in a convincing initial presentation. All of the writing in the headquarters is even laid out in Russian. It looked like the Soviet hammer of World War II was dropping, and it was alive and real and now. It was obvious Eugen cared. Nothing felt phoned in, and I was hopeful SD2 would be a labor of love. Anxious to get under the hood, I prepared for my first skirmish game and got to work exploring the deck building system. For those that don't know, Still Division doesn't operate like a traditional RTS. There are no resources or base building. Instead, the game is divided into three phases, where in each phase you get a steady flow of points that you can then spend on units you bring into battle. There are 18 different divisions, 26 if you have the Back to War pack from the previous game, and two more if you were in the beta. There's a nice portrait of each division's commander, along with some nice historical write-ups for each. Every division gets a customizable deck of different units that you can pick from to include in your battles. The limiting factor in deck building is your points, usually 50 or so, and as you add additional units to each subcategory, the slots become progressively more expensive. There are some changes from the old system, and it's obvious Eugen was aiming to provide more flexibility to the player. For starters, you get to choose how you want your points to be distributed across the phases, rather than be tied to a default flow. Aggressive players can choose to make their division a vanguard and get a heavy stream of points in the early phases, or you can take the opposite approach and be a heavy hitter in C. Then again, you're free to go with a simple balanced approach. You can now choose the veterancy of your units, which influences mechanics such as suppression rate and combat effectiveness, the compromise being the higher the veterancy, the less reserves you'll be able to call. In addition to leaders, who increase the veterancy of any unit within its circle, commanders have been added to the deck. Commanders generally stay behind the front lines and communicate via radio to any leader within range. From there, additional buffs will be dispersed amongst the troops. The most significant alteration of the deck system is that you can now get any unit you want in any phase you want, Heavy tanks and crack troops are no longer confined to the final phases. There's a trade-off there as well, however. Have that panther available for phase A, and you may only get to call in one instead of four or five in the later rounds. Overall, I like the new system because it gives more options, but it could make an already complex system even more intimidating for newcomers. However, make no mistake about it, the deck system is an incredible mechanic and one of the highlights of the game. You can easily find yourself lost within it, trying to decipher its puzzle-like mystique. I can't tell you how many times I told myself that a deck would be perfect if I could just find a way to fit in that final unit, and that's indicative of a polished system. Aside from the building itself, just delving into all of the information, the details of the armor, penetration values, and weapon systems, is fun, and it can even provide a bit of a history lesson to the uninitiated. They really up the authenticity here. Real portraits, and the units even have ammo types. This AT gun has APCR and AP shells. One thing I don't like is the effective ranges. Almost all units have a hard cap effective range of 2,000 meters, which is a bit unrealistic. Diving into the meat of the skirmish mode, nothing has really changed from the core mechanics of the original. You call up units as you need them and as they're allowed by your points, and the basic rock-paper-scissors system of a traditional RTS is still in place, albeit with realistic ranges and penetration potentials. A Lindley Sherman won't really be able to penetrate a tiger, and the AI is pretty good. No, it's not perfect, but it definitely doesn't feel like a cheater, and it isn't spammy. If you want to see how far the AI has come over the years, take a look at Eugen's old war game series. Whereas those games literally Zerg rushed you with hundreds of units and zero tactics, Still Division's AI can actually think. 
To be honest, it's difficult to think of another RTS that's a league above it in the AI department. The scale itself is massive, even more so than the original Steel Division. So Eugen intuitively tried to mitigate the overload of units by grouping them together according to composition at zoomed out ranges. It's similar to how the old war game did it, but you still have the option of zooming in and micromanaging individually if you so choose. It's a nice compromise. And this is a preference, but I couldn't help but wish the default game time was slowed down a bit. In SD2, you have way more units than in SD1. And this game is supposed to be a strategic and thinking man's game, more than a typical RTS. A compromise between a true slow-paced strategy that's turn-based and a click fest. The problem is, at this speed and with the extra units, your clicks per minute play an even larger role than it did in SD1, and SD1 was pushing it. But what can you do? Audio-wise, SD2 can be a bit of a dichotomy. You really feel the bass and boom of the larger caliber guns. When a tank fires off a round, you can almost feel it. The screen shakes, the sound is excellent, and you can sense the explosive energy erupting from the barrel. On the other hand, small arms fire is a bit lackluster. The sporadic bursts and random pops of rifles that you would expect to hear on the battlefield are instead filled with a predictably constant, steady stream of fire, and it can really take you out of the experience. Hearing an MG-34 rattle off for five seconds straight, or listening to the repetitive ping of a Mossy Noggin faithfully fire every second, really detracts from the immersion. Maybe they should have abstracted it a bit more. Introduce a type of randomizer to the duration between shots and bursts, but keep the DPS the same. Moving on to the graphics, what can I say? They're gorgeous. The way you can seamlessly zoom in from Skyview down to the minutia is a feat only seen in games like Supreme Commander. Watching tanks duel from 1500 meters is an absolute joy. And those smoke columns. Those lovely, delicious smoke columns. It's true that most of the game are zoomed out and just looking at counters from way above, but I found myself constantly going back to replays and removing the HUD to just watch the battles up close. You can even admire from an aerial perspective. The tiny columns of destroyed tanks and sporadic flashes of rifles and bursts from artillery, it looks really nice. I took a ride along with a Yakker FW-190 more than a couple of times. SD2 feels particularly polished for a new release. Yes, there are a few problems here and there, but overall, it's solid. Oh. And it's also nice to see Eugen representing some of the soldiers from the eastern half of the Soviet Union, because it's not something you see too often in gaming. And they made sure to really represent them. In summary, the mechanics and visuals are spot on. But that was never really the issue with Still Division in the first place. In fact, the stellar gameplay was what left people so thirsty with the original title. You had these amazing mechanics and AI, but an entirely lackluster campaign, and no way to stretch the legs of that great core experience. Eugen was aware of this Achilles heel, so what did they do to remedy it? Enter Army General Mode. The big schmabang that everyone was waiting on. The new campaign that would either make or break SD2. When you open it up, you're presented with several mini-campaigns within Operation Bagradian to choose from. Each contains some nice background information, along with dates, divisions involved, and historical info. Much like the rest of the game, Army General Mode is seeping with authenticity and the included historical footage is absolutely incredible. Its quality is pristine and some of the best I've ever seen. The HD photos are nothing to glance over either. If I had one gripe with the initial impression, it would be the narrator's mispronunciation of Bagradian. Now, don't get me wrong, I get pronunciations wrong all the time, but I don't make big budget titles only to state the very operation my game's named after incorrectly. Codename, Operation Bagration. But anyway, I saw the map and felt relief. In fact, my first thought was, wow, this is not some tacked-on gimmick. You can tell from the get-go that army mode is going for depth. Legit orders of battle, counters galore, dug-in units, reinforcements, casualty lists, topography to work around. This looked legit. And then I thought, holy shit, too legit. I need to check the manual. Thankfully, you can hit the escape button and the manual is right there to see, which is an awesome touch. It goes into pretty nice depths, too. It breaks down counters and their designations, explains that each counter represents a battalion and scale, and really helps you to understand the basic mechanics quite nicely. Every turn is three hours, and each battalion gets a set of action points designated by the number to the right of their counter. Action points are required for movement and attacks, and I quickly discovered you can select multiple battalions at once and move them in unison, which is a great quality of life tool. 
Air power is separated into bombers and fighters, and can be called directly into the battles themselves if they have action points, or can be held back and used on the strategic map to remove enemy action points or block enemy air within a defined radius. The top left of the UI is your base of operations. It's where you check OOBs, casualty lists, and operational overviews. Just beneath that are your available command points, which you can use to buy reinforcements that are available from your various corps along the top. You don't control your own logistical lines, but supply is still abstracted and encirclements carry hefty penalties. Clicking on a battalion will draw up its card, which presents you with important information such as strength, number of units, and quality of the units within the group. If you can't find something in the manual, rest assured that everything is excellently tool-tipped. Want to know how far a unit can travel through forests? No problem. Just hover the mouse over it and the information is presented to you. The UI is excellent and everything is intuitive by a wargamer standard at least. So it's a bit ironic that the most frustrating bit of Army General was learning how to actually initiate an attack. It took forever to figure out, so I'll just go ahead and spare you the trouble. You have to have a battalion right next to an enemy, and that battalion has to have three action points. From there, you click on the enemy unit you want to attack, rather than your own unit. A bunch of letters will pop up over nearby battalions indicating which ones have the potential to join in, and what phase they can actually enter, and it's usually dependent upon their distance from the engagement. From there, you can pick three battalions to enter the fray, but make sure you select one of those empty boxes first, and then the battalion you want to call up, or it won't work. And that's that. Okay, okay, it sounds simple when it's explained to you, but try figuring it out with no instructions. You can choose to play the battles yourself, auto-resolve them, or semi-auto-resolve them where you handpick which units enter during which phase. After the battle, you get a super detailed AAR that goes as far as showing which units you lost in which phase. You can even pick which units you want to directly control in the battle and which you want to leave to the AI, which sounds awesome at first, especially if you're wanting to learn and can't handle the micromanaging yet, but it turns out it's broken, and it should be a top priority for Eugen to fix. You see, the way SD combat works when you play alongside the AI is the map gets split into two sections, yours and the AI's, and it'll leave a flare telling you which half of the map it's going to focus on while you're supposed to take care of the other half. What's the problem with this? Well, in regular skirmish mode, it's fine. But in Army General mode, when you want to control only artillery or the air power while the AI handles the groundwork, you're screwed, because it's only going to focus on half of the map. So if you want the AI to handle the troops while you just take care of support, the option isn't really viable. And it's simply because Eugen didn't take into account the possible combination in Army General mode. So you can't play the role of support command in an engagement, and that's a real shame. And in case you were wondering, the battalions in Army General mode aren't modifiable. You don't actually build decks like you would with skirmish mode, which was a wise move by Eugen. The battalions now represent their historical composition, and the units within them are limited. Once you run out, you run out for the remainder of the operation. What this means is that a tank battalion will have tons of tanks but hardly any infantry, and an artillery battalion will pretty much be stuck with field guns. And because SD is built on that rock-paper-scissors mechanic, that means you'll have to plan your strategic movements in a way where your various battalion types are in position to support one another and it becomes an integral and fun part of the gameplay. You're basically putting that rock-paper-scissor formula on the grand scale, and it's pretty cool. After a while, Army General Mode really starts to give that old Civilization vibe. Just one more turn. Before I knew it, I had played for hours, and could confidently call the mode a winner. As the campaign went on, I found myself skipping the tactical battles more and more, and instead began to focus solely on the strategic aspect. And that isn't because the tactical side was lacking. If you remember, that's an area where SD shines. I shifted because the strategic component was that good. And if that doesn't prove Army General a worthy addition to the game, I don't know what does. The Steel Division games can be divisive, and I get why. It's not quite a sim, not quite an RTS. Stuck in the middle, you're going to have haters on both ends. Finding myself on the simming end of the spectrum, I was at times frustrated with the pace and some of the gaming mechanics. Alternately, a gamer who finds joy in the competitive nature of an ultra-fast-paced strategy may be left wanting more. Because of this, SD occupies an odd space in the gaming sphere, and it happens to be one where the majority will be left with wanting something a little bit different than what's been brought to the table. Despite this, you can easily find your time in the game growing on the old Steam log, and I know that a game that keeps you coming back has to count for something. Do you ever see those people who deride a game, trash talk it and say it's shit, but then you check their hours and they've logged 200 hours into it? You don't want to be that guy. But SD2 makes it easy to see how those things happen. It's a game that's going to feel so close to so many people, but never quite gets there. And it lies in the formula of what Still Division is itself. 
but with the new army general mode, it manages to get a lot closer than before. And I'm sure I'll end up logging that 200 hours one day. And I can't be that hypocrite. I can't not recommend a title that keeps me coming back for months. So I have to give this one the green light. Eugen listened to their fans, and they took a step in the right direction. If we want the genre to grow, the Warsome community can't afford not to support this one.